Doctor Who is an absolute monster of a show. This is a franchise that has been around for longer than Star Wars, and when you look at how long it's been on the air, it's no surprise that things don't always add up from time to time. Contradictions, retcons, plot holes, and out-of-character behaviour are common sights in the show, so fans come up with words like timey-wimey and wibbly-wobbly and showrunner bad to explain them. However, there are moments when we can't just brush away these confusing bits, and we should really pick them apart. My name is Rich, welcome to Who Culture, and these are 10 things that make no sense in the modern series. Number 10. Dalek Khan lets his allies die for no reason. It's no secret that the Daleks are hard to get rid of. They're tough, merciless, and have a habit of surviving literally everything. They're basically the cockroaches of the universe. However, they're not invincible. Just ask Dalek Thay and Dalek Jast, who were blown to bits at the end of the evolution of the Daleks when Dalek Khan just sat back and let them be exterminated, even though he was in a position to stop this from happening. In this episode, the Dalek mad lads, the cult of Skaro, end up creating some Dalek human hybrids, but when the Doctor interferes, some of his Time Lord DNA is inadvertently thrown into the mix. This gives the hybrids that little bit more humanity, and because of this, they ultimately turn against the cult and kill two of its members, Dalek Thay and Dalek Jast. Then, right after this happens, Dalek Khan, who is safely back at base camp observing the whole situation, remotely kills every single hybrid by activating an implant inside their heads. But, hang on, why did he wait until after Jast and Thay were killed before using it? Dalek Khan actually orders Thay and Jast to destroy the hybrids, assumedly because he couldn't be bothered to reach for the death button. So instead of helping out his buddies, he simply sat and watched. So much for the Dalek Alex must survive. Number 9. Amy and Rory's best friend appears out of nowhere. We first meet Amy and Rory in the Series 5 opener, The Eleventh Hour, where we finally get a good look around Amy's house, their home village of Ledworth, and even bump into some of their friends, like Jeff, My name is Jeff. and the elderly Miss Angelo. It's one of the overall strength of Series 5 that we truly get to know and understand Amy and Rory as individuals and as a couple, but on the downside, this does mean that Mel's reveal in Series 6 makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. In the opening scenes of the mid-series premiere Let's Kill Hitler, we're introduced to a character called Mel's, who is apparently Amy and Rory's bestest friend in the whole wide world, a relationship that dates all the way back to when they were kids. Now it sounds fine on paper, but here's the problem, we only ever met Mel's in this episode and we never heard of her beforehand. So all the time we spent in Ledworth and everything up to this point with Amy and Rory, we never heard of Mel's once. Of course, the explanation here is that Stephen Moffat hadn't actually come up with the idea of Mel's up to this point, but it doesn't excuse the fact that it makes zero sense for her to pop up out of nowhere. They could have gone back and just badly superimposed her onto old scenes, they did it in Scrubs with Kim and it basically worked. Number 8. Davros's reality bomb somehow fails. Davros and the Daleks have had a lot of evil plans over the years, but the scheme they came up with in the Series 4 finale is probably their smartest one to date, because, in theory, it should be unstoppable, but it was still stopped. In Journey's End, Davros attempts to utilise a reality bomb to destroy all matter in the universe. Crucially though, it won't just destroy one universe, it will destroy all of them. Davros gleefully states this bomb will affect every dimension, every parallel, every single corner of creation, meaning that nothing is safe from its blast. So while the bomb is ultimately stopped in the main reality we see on screen, surely there's a parallel world where Davros succeeds, meaning that the main universe and every other universe will also be wiped out too? Remember, there could be a million parallel universes out there, so the odds an alternate Davros successfully detonates the bomb are quite high, right? Number 7. The Doctor Can't Be Bothered Disrupting the Dalek Shields The divisive victory of the Daleks includes a silly yet highly entertaining sequence in which a group of Spitfires are sent into space to shoot up a Dalek ship. Just go with it. After we see the planes in space for the first time, the Doctor heads back to the TARDIS while instructing the pilots to blow up a huge dish on the side of the ship. The planes then attempt to pump this dish full of lead, but to no avail. There are shields in the way, and it can't take any damage. Then, to make matters even worse, the Daleks use lasers to destroy two of the three planes. At this point, the last remaining Spitfire pilot asks the Doctor for help, and the Doctor says he can temporarily disrupt the Dalek shield so the dish can be destroyed. Great stuff! Hey Doctor! Victory is in sight, but wait a second, why didn't the Doctor do this as soon as he got back to the TARDIS? You know, before the first two planes were blown up? Instead, he just stood around the TARDIS console looking all sad. Nicely done, Doctor. Number 6. The image of an angel becomes an angel. Sometimes. When the Weeping Angels returned in Series 5, Stephen Moffat introduced several new elements to their lore, such as the ability to snap people's necks, their ability to steal the voices of their victims, their ability to laugh, and their ability to be complete shit from here on out. Thank you, Stephen! Another rule that was also established is that which holds the image of an angel can itself become an angel, which basically means that any pictures or videos of Weeping Angels will eventually turn into real Weeping Angels, so good luck watching this video, folks, you're about to die. It's an interesting idea that's put to good use in a creepy sequence where Amy is caught cornered by a TV screen with an angel on it, but unfortunately this rule does create a big issue when you look back at the first appearance of the angels in Series 3's Blink. In the final scene of this story, protagonists Sally and Larry are shown holding a folder that contains everything they know about the angels, including several photographs.
photographs. So why don't these photographs turn into angels? In the Time of Angels, it is mentioned that the angels in Blink weren't at full strength, but still, we never got a full explanation as to why these photographs didn't adhere to that rule that Series 5 established. Of course, Stephen Moffat hadn't thought up this rule when he wrote Blink, but it is a pretty annoying inconsistency regardless. Number 5. Innocent people die because the Doctor is nice to the villain. Human Nature and the Family of Blood is one of the best Tenth Doctor stories ever, but its entire premise falls apart once you start to scrutinise it. The plot kicks off with the Doctor being chased down by the Family, a group of aliens who are thirsty for immortality and believe the Doctor can help them achieve it. So in order to evade them, the Doctor turns himself to a human, living in a small village in the early 1900s and becoming a teacher at a nearby school. But this doesn't stop the Family from tracking him down, and when they do, they wreak havoc through the village, killing many innocent people in the process. This forces the Doctor to come out of hiding and take them down, which he does in about a minute flat, so why didn't he just do this straight away? Apparently the Doctor was simply being kind to the family by not unleashing justice upon them, but this is a pretty flimsy excuse since the Doctor usually isn't that kind to many villains, especially when they're just this ruthless. We know the Doctor gives villains a chance, but if they don't deserve it, he should just dish out justice instead. So many people died because of him hiding. Number 4. The Doctor and Bill forget about video calling Series 10 took a surprising turn when it revealed the Doctor was actually blind after oxygen, and rather than fixing this issue right away, which is something that the show likes to do with major problems, he actually stayed like this for a couple of episodes. This proves rather problematic at the climax of the seventh episode, The Pyramid at the End of the World, where the Doctor has to enter a four-digit combination to escape a room that's about to go boom. Also, who does it through wheelie thingies? Where's a keypad when you need it, for goodness sake? Since he can't see the numbers and will definitely die if he doesn't escape the room, Bill is forced to make an ill-advised deal with the monks to restore the Doctor's eyesight, allowing him to enter the code. Well, we say forced because that technically isn't true, because there was a much simpler solution to this problem the writers clearly overlooked. To explain this, let's go back to Series 9's Under the Lake, where we're shown that the sonic sunglasses are capable of transmitting video via Wi-Fi, a trick the Doctor uses after trapping the ghosts in the Faraday cage. So, flash forward to the pyramid at the end of the world, and the issue becomes clear. Why doesn't the Doctor just send a video feed of the lock to Bill, who he's currently on a phone call with, allowing her to guide him to the right combination? Bill's modern phone will definitely be able to show video, so so it's quite annoying they suddenly seem to both forget about technology. Number 3. The Werewolf's Inconsistent Allergy Tooth and Claw is a fun romp of an episode, one you can watch without having to engage with your brain too much. But if you do start to think about it, you might spot a massive logic error that completely breaks the story's climax. In the middle of the episode, the Doctor and Rose barricade themselves in a room in order to hide from the pointy fangs and sharp claws of a big hairy werewolf, no not me. The Beastie can't enter this room because it's allergic to mistletoe, and the wooden walls have been varnished with mistletoe oil. So instead it climbs onto the roof and smashes through the glass ceiling. Smart doggy. This forces the Doctor and Rose to run out of the room and into a corridor closing the door behind them, and this is where things get odd. Since the wolf couldn't get into the room by using the door, it also shouldn't be able to get out using the door either because it's still laced with mistletoe juice. However, a few shots later, the werewolf has followed them out of the room and is in the corridor with them. To make matters even more confusing, Wolfie is stopped in his tracks by mistletoe broth seconds after magically escaping the room, so is it allergic to mistletoe, or isn't it? This episode seems to change its mind as and when, and I apologise the fact you'll now notice this on your next rewatch. Number 2. The Doctor Dies From Falling, Except When He Doesn't While the closing act of The End of Time Part 2 is constantly barraging us with low blow emotional punches to the dick, there is one point in that episode that doesn't really sit well. That is the point when the Doctor jumps out of a spaceship that's so high in the sky, it turns into a dot the farther he falls, he smashes through the ceiling of this building and hits the floor. He's only got a few cuts and scratches, and in only a couple of seconds he's up and pointing a gun at Rassilon. Now the Doctor is an interesting being, we've seen him survive quite a lot in his time, and falling from a spaceship goodness knows how high up in the air doesn't seem so ridiculous, except the fact that the Doctor has managed to be injured by much less. Let's go back to the final televised fourth Doctor story, Logopolis. Tom Baker's Doctor died and regenerated because of a fall that was a hell of a lot shorter than whatever the distance was David Tennant just fell. It really wasn't much, so how David Tennant and even Jodie Whittaker falling from the TARDIS from basically orbit manages to survive, it's quite a strange inconsistency. I'm guessing after the events of Logopolis, the Time Lord managed to evolve in his regeneration to gain, I don't know, like Homer Simpson's solid head but just all over so he can survive falls? I don't know. Number 1. The Master Destroys Gallifrey Like It's Nothing Gallifrey falls no more, thought Stephen Moffat while he was penning the 50th anniversary special The Day of the Doctor. No! Gallifrey falls more, responded Chris Chibnall, while envisioning his master plan for Series 12. Yes, as revealed earlier this year, and yes, we're probably still a bit sore from all of this, Gallifrey has been destroyed once again. It does feel a little bit too soon for this, considering the events of the Time War and The Day of the Doctor are still relatively recent, but if this is what Chris Chibnall wants to do, then fair enough. 
let's see where he goes with this in series 13. But there is one very annoying problem with his decision to destroy Gallifrey. Namely, the manner in which it was destroyed doesn't really seem to add up. All we're told in series 12 is that the Master did it. That's it. The Master, a single person managed to waltz in and completely destroy one of the most powerful civilizations in the universe. Just like that? Even if he somehow had another death particle, which he doesn't, that wouldn't be enough anyway because it only affects organic matter. So how is it done, Chibnall? How? The main issue here is that if it's this easy to destroy Gallifrey, then shouldn't it have been blown up in the past by the Daleks, the Cybermen, and pretty much any other alien species with a grudge against the Time Lords? The only plus side to this whole debacle is the fact that this has only recently happened, so there's a good chance we'll get a bit more of an explanation soon, hopefully. But for now, it simply doesn't make sense that the Master, who has been foiled by next to Nafal in the past and has failed to take over even a primitive planet like Earth, has managed to take down Gallifrey. Chibnall really did the Time Lords dirty in series 12. And that is my list of things that make absolutely no sense in the modern series of Doctor Who. Are there any things I've missed and do you have any logical explanations to anything on here? Please let me know in the comments section down below. Don't forget to subscribe to the Who Culture YouTube channel if you haven't already. You can follow us on Twitter at Who Culture and please check out the Escaping Kerberos Doctor Who rewatch podcast. I have been Rich, you can follow me on Twitter at PickupChangeToe and on Twitch at Rich's Live. Take care of yourselves and I will see you soon.